Well, thank you, thank you for coming back. As you can tell, the, um, <laughs> the numbers dwindle as this seminar goes on. And um, I've, I've had to reconcile myself to the fact that I am not on the attendance committee. The Spirit is on the attendance committee. I'm just on the presenters list, okay? So you try to present this and give this. Um, and those who can receive it, we pray they'll receive it. And those who can't, they're just not quite ready for it. So thank you. Thank you for coming again. Um, as I continue to look at my notes and to find out how far we've gotten, I, I got a little behind. Um, I get all caught up in some of this. I think about it all the time. I have all these illustrations that are meaningful to me. But I realize that i got to go a little faster tonight. So if you have my notes... Um, I'm going to be on the interpreter, and then I'm going to get into the method tonight. Everything so far has been introductory. <laughs> Everything has been trying to convince us we're not doing it well. Everything is trying to convince us we're being manipulated by other forces than the Spirit. And once we realize that, it's shocking, and it's painful. Uh, I don't know any other way to do it than make it shocking and painful. So tonight I want to talk about the interpreter. And of course that's you. And I want you to hear my basic premise again. You, the Bible, and the Holy Spirit have priority. The worst thing you can do is pick up a commentator. Or have a favorite preacher. Or a favorite author. Or a favorite denomination. <laughs> Those are agendas. God wants to speak through you. God called you. You have a gift. You have a place. You have a sphere of influence. You are significant in Bible interpretation. But all of us, all of us, all of us wear glasses. And these glasses are where I was born, who I was born to, when I was born, my, my experience as a young person, where I went to school, the significant people in my life, all of these become filters. And it is very hard to see a, a text without these filters. As a matter of fact, it is, it is impossible to be a neutral interpreter. We are all affected by these filters. But if I know I have these filters, maybe I can reduce their influence. If I know I'm pulled this way, maybe I can read that text clearer. Now, at this point in the seminar, I have done a lot of evangelical, what I think are problems. I do not have time to do that. I do want to read some of these. And if you're interested in hearing my opinion about this, you're going to have to go online and go to the video seminar. But here's the topics I usually talk about here. Christian music, mixed swimming, <laughs> you can tell I'm from the South, use of tobacco, use of alcohol, storehouse tithing, interracial marriage, baptism, time, method, administer, and formula, and how one celebrates Christmas and Halloween. Now, I, those are all controversial subjects. But I promise you, most of them are this. That's not Bible. Those are this. And this screams louder than the Bible in most cultures. And so what we've got to do is we want to present people Jesus with as little of this as we possibly can. Now, we can't remove it completely because that's who we are. Uh, but the gospel is not about how we grew up and what we think and what our denomination. The gospel is about Jesus. Amen. <laughs> so he's what we want to present. So what can be done? Um, we must recognize that we have biases. I'm afraid that where I have grown up, um, I have some biases. Um, I am biased against legalists. Really, New Testament Pharisees give me a rash. <laughs> um, I know it. Uh, I am biased against fundamentalism. But I've got to pray for them. Because they can reach people I can't. And, but I, I, I need to demand that they don't try to make me like them. Because in the church, we've confused unity and uniformity. And I think our diversity is a gift from God to reach a diverse, lost population. So what do I have to do when I analyze or try to list what, what I'm biased against? Well, 
For me, the easiest way to start this discussion is to say, and I remember the professor that asked me this in, in, in seminary, and it was an aha moment for me. He said, what is the least that someone can believe and be a Christian? Not the most, not the best, not the mature. What is the least, the least, the absolute, bare bones, irreducible minimum? And uh, I said to him, well, well, what do you think? He said, I'm not going to answer you. You go home and find, think about it. Well, I came back in a few days and I had five things. And he said to me, well, thank God, Bob, you didn't have 25 things. Now you say, I know you're saying, tell me what they are. <laughs> no. But those, that irreducible minimum is what I'm willing to die for. There is a wonderful little uh, slogan from the, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church has it now. It came from an early church father. I've forgotten his name. And the quote goes like this. In essentials, unity. In peripherals, freedom. In all things, love. Now, we may fight over what's essential and what's peripheral in some areas, but I refuse to let my millennial position color the gospel. I refuse to let my denominational distinctives. One guy said to me one time, Dr. Bob, we want you to come and teach Baptist distinctives. And I said to him, I'd just as soon throw up. Why would I, if they're Bible truths, why would I call them Baptist distinctives? And if they're not Bible truths, why under heaven would I teach it? These irreducible minimums are the core of historical Christianity that all denominations hold to. That must become the focus of our study, our presentation, and the place our biases cannot affect. Now... I hope you will think about that. The more you know, the less judgmental you'll become. The ones who scream the most are the ones who refuse to look at hermeneutics, refuse to analyze their biases, refuse to recognize denominational indoctrination. The more you recognize that we wear these glasses, the less judgmental you be of others who also wear glasses. What kind of glasses is not the issue. All human beings are historically affected. Me, you, your mother, your preacher, your seminary professor, <laughs> we're all affected by where we live, where we grew up. So what can we do? Well, first of all, I would say the Bible demands interpretation. I just love the people who come and say, no, Bob, I just read the Bible and do it. You do not. Matthew 5, 29, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. I've never seen a blind, uh, one-armed Christian yet. Besides, your six sins from being a b blind paraplegic. You don't take that literally. Get out of here. What you take literally is what you want to take literally. And when somebody else takes something literal that you don't, then suddenly there are... See, I, the Bible... Listen, this is going to be a shocking statement. The Bible is not literal, it's literary. And when we turn it into, it, it has to mean this because the English word means this, we lose all the poetry, all the parallelism, all the imagery, all, all the figurativeness that's so rich in Scripture, both Old Testament and New. So the Bible must be interpreted. The Spirit is crucial in interpretation. Whenever we pick up this book, we need to confess our sins and ask for his help. I mean, there's every time we pick it up, because we pick it up with unholy hands, unclean hands. We must walk in the light we have. And that light's going to be different depending on your opportunities for training, your opportunities God has provided, your giftedness that God has provided. I want you to think about this. We're going to stand before God only for what we've understood from the Bible and how we've applied it. You are not responsible for my knowledge. I am not responsible for yours. But I am responsible for what I think the Bible says and how I've lived that out. When I talk to pre preachers, I say to them, you know, I don't always know when to change churches. 
I don't always know what to preach on. I don't always know what to do. So I pray. I ask God to help me. I look for uh, people who may be speaking for him. I look for circumstances. And then at some point I say, God, I think you want me here. If not, would you please close the door? And if I make a mistake, will you fix it? You, do you hear what that's, what that's saying? You've got to step out in faith on what you believe the Bible says. I would recommend that you talk to people you trust. I would recommend that you take time to pray and study. But you must act on what you believe the Bible says. Um, <clears throat> I believe if we're prayerful and read Scripture that more light will come because God is wanting to speak to us through Scripture and God has graciously given to each of us the Holy Spirit that is a means to understand Scripture, okay? Now, the second uh, point I want to start covering tonight is the method itself. And this is where um, all the rest is trying to get your attention. Now, here is what I'm presenting. In the ancient church, there were two schools of thought on how to present the Bible. One of them comes from Alexandria, Egypt. It's very early, 2nd century. And it comes, it's what we call allegory or spiritualizing. Now, basically, that has been influenced by a man named Philo. You may have heard of him. He was not a rabbi, but he was a Jew who lived in Alexandria, Egypt. He basically was a Neoplatonist who was committed to truth in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and Scripture. So he tried to find Jewish, I mean, Greek philosophical principles in Hebrew text. Now, how do you do that? Well, you have to cut it off from the historical setting. You have to redefine the words. And that's exactly what he did. How many sermons have I heard where a text is read and the, the pastor or presenter would say, now this word really means. No, no, no. It means what it means, right? You, you, you can't change the definition of these words and pull things completely out of literary context and say you're preaching the Bible. And we, we find strange things in the Bible that really apply not to the Bible but to us. But we're using little pieces and twisting meaning to make the Bible say something it never did. Is that me popping? Is it? I'm just hot tonight. <laughs> I'll be careful. What am I doing? All right. I'll try not to jump around. There's no weak point. Put it down. How's that? You just hate to spit on the Holy Spirit's instrument. <laughs> okay, uh, Origen, Clement of Alexandria, and particularly Augustine is the one who helped document this allegorical method. Every verse has five meanings. The least significant is the literal. The most significant is the philosophical or spiritual. Do you see what they're doing to text? They're taking it out of the realm of history and they're putting it in the realm of philosophy. That's what the Greeks, and they're saying, oh, we're trying to make the Bible relevant to Greek culture. Anytime someone tells you we're trying to make the Bible relevant, run. The Bible's relevant because it's God's book, amen? You don't need to make the Bible relevant. Okay, I'm over it. Uh, I think there is some aspects where both Paul and Jesus use somewhat of this method. Uh, Jesus in the parable of the soils, Paul in the comparison of the two mountains, I think it's typology, but some have seen this as allegory, and they say, see, the Bible itself does it. So just, just a moment. People always ask me, why don't I look at how the people in the Bible interpreted Scripture and do it the same way? Because the people in the Bible are inspired, and you're not. Now, you're illumined, but inspiration has ceased. And we know because we disagree that illumination is not the same spiritual level as inspiration. So we can't reproduce the method of the New Testament apostles. It's impossible. So what do we, what do, we do? Well, here is the problem that I see in allegory. And friends, it is alive and well. It lives in Wisconsin. It lives in Texas. It lives around the world. And when you start seeing it, it's going to shock you how often it appears. Number one. It imports meaning into the text. It forces a hidden meaning behind every text. 
It puts forth fanciful and far-fetched interpretations. It did not allow words and sentences to bear their obvious normal meanings. It allowed human subjectivity to dominate the plain message of the original author. There are no controls on, on it, this kind of interpretation. You can't say that's not a good interpretation because there's no way to evaluate it. Now, I want to read Martin Luther if you let me. <laughs> Martin Luther called allegory clerical jugglers performing monkey tricks. He also said, it's a sort of beautiful harlot. That's Martin Luther. Now, I, <laughs> there are two extremes in Bible interpretation. One is extreme literalism and one is allegory. And they're both the wings of the bird of destruction. And they are both active in the church. And I, I hope at least me talking about it can bring it to mind. So, I'm going to give you the other school. It developed in the 300 period. It's from Alexandria, Syria. Excuse me, it's Antioch, Syria. It is the church that sent Paul and Barnabas out. It was that center of Christianity, the center of the Great Commission Christianity. And these scholars there, uh, you might know them, Nic uh, Nicholas of Lyra had a background here, Chrysostom, these are some of the ones from that school. They would say, wait a minute, we need to take the Bible in its literal, normal, plain, on the surface meaning. Not read all this fanciful stuff in. So there became a challenge between these two groups. So what I have been trying to present you, now here are the basic, basic tenets of, of this system. It focuses on the plain, obvious, ordinary, common sense meaning of words and sentences. The meaning of the Bible is on the surface. You don't have to go down and find hidden meaning in numbers, down and ha have a special guru look in a crystal ball. It's on the surface and it's for everybody. Plain, ordinary meaning of words. No tricks here. Two, it tried to understand the original author's intent and interpret in light of his or her historical setting. Some of you may be surprised I say her for a Bible author. I really think... A, a, Priscilla may have written Hebrews. Ha! <laughs> Just, okay. Because of the textual focus, it became called the historical grammatical school of interpretation. It did become involved in a heresy called Nestorianism. Does Christ have one nature or two natures? Uh, there was a heresy involved in this school. This school was disciplined out of existence by the Roman Catholic Church. It started again in Constantinople. Now, I want to say to you, you know these names well. This is the interpretive method of Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, and Melanchthon. The classical Protestant reformers used this method. K. Arthur, do you know precepts? Do you know uh, John MacArthur, California? This is the method. I, I'm not a strange person. This is the method that these Bible teachers in the Protestant Reformation and modern teachers that you know use. So this is not strange, unusual, different. It is simply forcing us to read carefully the text of the Bible and not put our meaning, our want to, our background, our experience into that text. Um, okay, so here are the basic, the basic tenets. The Bible is written in normal human language. I want to get, read three quotes from, from Sire's Scripture Twisting. Uh, James Sire was the president of the InterVarsity Press. This book is out of print, still available on used books. It's a little book, won't cost you very much. I think you'll really be blessed by it. Let me give you a couple of quotes from him. The illumination comes to the minds of God's people, not just the spiritually elite. There is no guru class in biblical Christianity, no Illuminati, no people through whom all proper interpretation must come. And so, while the Holy Spirit gives special gifts of wisdom, knowledge, and spiritual discernment, he does not assign these grifted Christians to be the only authoritative interpreters of his word. It is up to each of his people to learn, to judge, to discern by reference to the Bible, which stands as the authority even over those to whom God has given special abilities. I want you to see what I'm doing. I am getting off of the pedestal 
and I am putting all of us on the pedestal. Do you understand what I'm doing? I'm depreciating my position to tell you it's all of our responsibility. Don't call me up and ask me what I think. Look at the Bible. Who cares what I think? It's another quote by Sire. To summarize, the assumption I'm making throughout this entire book, Scripture Twisting, is that the Bible is God's true revelation to all humanity. It is our, own, our ultimate authority on all matters about which it speaks. That, is not a t that it is not a total mystery, but can be adequately understood by ordinary people in every culture. Can I get an amen? This is not what, what is your IQ. This is not what is your spiritual gift. This is not do, how many years have you been in the church. This is the people of God are responsible for, for living and knowing God's revelation. The Bible must be interpreted in light of its own historical setting and literary context. Meaning it is not to be interpreted in light of your historical setting. <laughs> We've got to first say what did it mean to them before we can say what does it mean to us. The intent of the original inspired author as expressed in the text is the focus of interpretation. This is a textually focused biblical method of interpretation. Now, what have I done? Bob lives in Texas, loves hermeneutics, called by God to teach it. What have I done? I have taken the tenets of the, Alexand of the Antiochian school and I've tried to put a modern western outline. You know when, when professional pilots take off and land. Now they've taken off tens of thousands of times. But every time a professional pilot gets ready to land or take off, they go through a checklist, right? You know that? They check, yes, yes, yes. Because the human mind tends to forget. I was, I was a, a, a flying one time out of Midland, and I was a student pilot, and I knew I could do it without that checklist. I left the flaps down, almost couldn't get off the runway because I didn't go over the list. Now, what I'm going to do for you is give you a checklist. And what I hope you hear and see my face is, did you check? Did you check? Did you check? Did you check? And you never get away from that. Did you check? Did you check? Now, what I've done is structure this. Seven questions to ask every paragraph and four reading cycles. Seven questions Four reading cycles. Now, here are the seven questions. What did the original author say? Now, th this is what I call textual criticism. Can I go back to the oldest manuscripts we have? Can I go back to where I can say this was probably original? I want to make sure I'm preaching the Bible and not some church tradition. Now, I, in the seminar, I do deal with about five major uh, textual critical problems of the New Testament. And I wish I had time to do it with you. One of them is the ending of Mark. One of them is John 5, 4. One of them is the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer. One is the Trinitarian text out of First uh, John 5. But I... There is no textual problem that damages any major Christian doctrine because... Where that text may not be valid, other texts preach that same thing, teach that same thing. So you're never going to miss truth by this. But let's just take the end of Mark for a minute. Where, you know in Appalachia they do handle snakes, right, as a sign of worship? You do know that. Where are your snakes? I mean, really, you're a Bible person. Where are your snakes? Do you drink poison to verify you're a Christian? Both of that comes from the ending of Mark. Mark ends in verse 8. They went out afraid. The early church knew that's a terrible place to end the gospel. There are four different endings to the gospel of Mark in the early manuscripts. The longest one of them is in King James. The words in King James are never used anywhere else in Mark. There is no, there is no documentation of that for hundreds of years in any of the church fathers.
When I, in my commentary, when I come to Mark 18, uh, 16, 8, I just stop commenting because I don't believe the rest is inspired. And I'm committed to apostolic truth. And besides, that's, that's, that's false doctrine about drinking poison and handling snakes is God's way of verifying faith. And the groups that do believe that tend to get smaller and smaller. <laughs> I'm so glad y'all laughed. It's obviously you're not snake handlers. Okay, number two. What did the original author mean? Now, this is, this is where I'm going to get into these four reading cycles. This is what we call exegesis. This is reading the text carefully and asking questions. You've got to get used to asking the Bible questions. See if you can find the answer in the footnotes. See if you can find the answer in the parallel passages. If not, we've got to go to commentaries. We've got to go to word studies. We've got to go to hard sayings of the Bible. Yes, we need people, but only at the appropriate time. After you've prayed, after you've read, after you've studied... Number three, what did the original author say elsewhere on the same subject? It's parallel passages. Quick, let me do one. In Ephesians 5, it talks about ever be filled with the Spirit. Now, what does that mean to you? It depends on your background. But you know that Colossians is written first, and on the very outline, Ephesians is written. So if I can find the parallel to ever be filled with the Spirit... In Colossians, maybe I'll get a hint. And Colossians says, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you at the exact place in the outline. Man, do parallel passages help. Let's just take the, the, in Ephesians, heavenly places. Now that little, it's only one word, heavenlies. It's only used five times in the whole New Testament. And every one of them is in Ephesians. And the first time you hear it, you think it's talking about heaven when we die. But in chapter 6, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and world forces of wickedness in heavenly places, right? So it's a spiritual conflict here and now. Parallel passages help us find what these words mean. We've got to start looking at the parallels. Okay, number, six, number three. Uh, that is, that was three. Here's four. What did, the Bibli what did other biblical authors say on the same subject? I, if I'm going to do, do Paul, then I need to find parallels in the same book if I can. If not the same book, can I find parallels, say, in other prison epistles? If I can't find them in other prison epistles, can I find them in other books by Paul? If I can't find them in other books by Paul, can I find other New Testament authors? If I can't find other New Testament authors, is there any place in the Old Testament I can go to? So it's like concentric circles of relevance. I'm trying to stay as close as I can to the original author and how is he defining his words. But if I can't, I'm moving out to other inspired texts. The best interpreter of an inspired Bible is an inspired Bible. The next one, how did the original hearers understand it? Now, we don't always know. But many times in the gospel it says, and the Pharisees knew he was talking about them. <laughs> Sometimes it tells us what the, the, hear, the original hearers understood. If it does, we've got to make note of that. Next one, and these two are application. I think it is a sin to study the Bible historically. No one cares how much you know about the Bible back then. What they want to know is how you live today. Amen? Bible interpretation that stops with what it meant and does not go to what it means is an abomination and an arrogance factor. We must apply this truth to our day. we got to pay the price to know what the issue and the subject is. is but then, now here's the creativity of the Spirit in our backgrounds. and our, we got to apply that to our people, our family, our need, our day, our church. Next one. How does the original message apply to my day? Last one. How does the original message apply to my life? Okay, five of these are what, is, what did it mean? Two of these are what does it mean to me, to my day? And those are the seven questions. Now, for the next few moments, uh, well, not few, but, you know, significant amount of time that I have left I want to go through each of these questions if I could so first I'm going to do this first interpretive question that has to do with textual criticism people always say to me do I have to know Koine Greek to fully interpret the Bible 
And I want to say to you, no. Now, in my school, our Greek teacher was so hard that our young preachers took Spanish to graduate. You've got to have two years of a language, right? I taught first year Greek, second year teacher was a killer. And they just switched to Spanish. That's a sin. If they have the chance and the opportunity, they need to pay the price, whatever it is. Amen? If you never have the chance and never have the opportunity, don't feel bad. Because 99.9% .9 of the world never has an opportunity. And people only know about Jesus through translations. Amen? And I don't think there's, you know, we say many of us have had two or three or four years of Greek or Hebrew. With two or three or four years of a language, we're only on a fifth grade level, maybe. Maybe a fifth grade level. So, you know, we just love to say this Greek word means. I, I always get, I'm, I'm, I'm chasing a rabbit, I know. I always get tickled when people say to me, you didn't pronounce that word right. It's like you know, fool. <laughs> We've taken an ancient Greek language, taken all of their accents out, put a phonetic alphabet on their uh, letters, and we know how to pronounce it? Give me a break. Arrogance is rampant in academia. Okay, I think we don't need that. Um, I want to talk a, minute, a little bit about the problem of interpreting human languages. Number one, you and I, with a written text, don't hear voice inflection and mannerisms, right? Those are gone. When Jesus said to the Syrophoenician woman, uh, the, uh, it's not fair to give the crumbs to the dogs. Now, that sounds so negative. But I want you to know that Greek word there is not dog. It's little puppy. It's the diminutive form of dog. Um, I, I think he's playing with that lady's faith. I don't think he's calling that, that woman a street mongrel. No, no. See, we've missed it because of our definition of dog. Another one, I think. When you hear the, the story of the parable of the Pharisee and the sinner, you, you know the Pharisee is bad. But friends, the people who first heard that, the Pharisee was Billy Graham. It would, it would shock them the Pharisee was bad. But you, you already know he's bad. So you read it in up front. See, that ain't going to work. Uh, there are a lot of idioms we don't know. Um, I get tickled when people say, well, when you die, you sleep until the second coming. Where'd you get that? Well, it says in the Bible, and they slept with their fathers. You don't know idioms. In the Old Testament, to sleep with your fathers meant you were in Sheol. You were conscious. There just was no joy, no conversation. That's not sl a soul sleep. That is an idiom from the Old Testament. We have to take the Bible in the way it's using words, not the way we use words. Remember Job's wife? And when she said, uh, uh, curse God and die, she didn't say curse God. She said, bless God and die. But the word blessed is used in a, in a negative sense. You have to know that or you miss the whole point. By the way, I think God really got her. The pregnant lady who sang, is she still in here? I want you to think for a minute what God did to Job's wife. He only had one wife. She said, curse God and die. And God said, fine. I'm going to replace all his children and you're the only wife. That lady was pregnant forever. <laughs> okay, just a thought. Uh, the second interpretive question has to do with how do I understand, how do I understand the Bible? Now, this is where I get into the four reading cycles. So just think of me for a minute what I'm trying to do. And this is where people all the time say to me, well, I'm not doing that. That's just too much work. I'm not doing that. And may I lovingly say to you, then quit speaking for God. If you're not willing to pay the price to know, what gives you the right to give your opinion? If you're not willing to study and do it right, why do you think you have the right to speak? Now, here are the reading cycles. First of all, I'm going to ask you at the end of this to pick out a small book and try this method on. When you try this method, it's going to bless you but confuse you. You're going to want to go back and hear this seminar again. It's going to make so much more sense after you try it. And then you're going to stay with it. And once you start staying with it, remember when you first saw uh, these letters of the alphabet and someone said, you're going to learn these and you're going to make words and you're going to speak sentences. And you said, no way I can do it. You did. First one, you read the whole book. Now, please don't start with Deuteronomy. I taught Deuteronomy verse by verse at my church took me 14 months of Wednesday nights. I was so glad when Moses died. Golly, was I tired of Deuteronomy. Mercy's sake. Don't do Deuteronomy or Jeremiah. Do Colossians. 
uh, uh, do Titus. Uh, do First do John. And here's what you do. You got the, a Bible translation you like. And you're going to read the whole book at one sitting. The whole book at one sitting. And you're going to say to yourself, what is this book about? No, no, in one sentence, what is this book about? Is this about nuclear physics? Is this about the second coming? Is, is, is this about uh, fleshly sin? What is this book about? What is the one topic this is about? Now, friends, that's what every chapter is going to deal with. Don't let all this extraneous stuff pile in there on ambiguous terms and little pieces of text. No, no. What's the big picture? And these are the question. What is this book about? And number two, what kind of genre is it? Is it poetry? Is it letter? Is it prophecy? Is it apocalyptic? Is it gospel? Is it historical? What kind of? It's all you do the first time. Then put your Bible away for a while. Another day, another week. Go back and read the whole thing again. With this in mind, you're going to say to yourself, okay, I think I know what it's about. Now, who wrote it? When did they write it? And who did they write it to? The historical. You can get most of that from the first two lines or the very last two lines. And once you get trained, you'll, it's all there. Where do you think all those books on the scholars get of hundreds of pages come from? Those first two lines. All that information is there. You just got to learn how to develop it. Who wrote it? When did they write it? Now, at this point, once you do that, you may want to go. This is the first time you go to a help. This is all done you for, by yourself. You may want to go to an outline in a study Bible or a commentary or a Bible encyclopedia. And you want to look and see what they think the main truth is. Who do they think the author is? Who do they think the date is? Who do they think the recipient? Check yourself. Amen. Maybe you've got to erase it and change. No problem. After you try it, get some help. Okay? Reading number three. Put your Bible away for a few days. Come back and read the whole book again. Here's what you're looking for this time. I want to know how the major truth is developed. What I'm saying to you, how many Roman numerals are in this book? Let's just take Romans for a minute. You got 1 through 17 is a long introduction. Beginning in 118 through 331, all have sinned, right? Beginning in chapter 4, you have an Old Testament precedent for justification by grace through faith. Chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8 deal with the Christian life. 9 through 11, what about unbelieving Israel? 12 through 15, how does this apply to my life? 16, thank you for helping me, goodbye. Now suddenly, I'm beginning to see the flow of this book. How is the author developing this truth? It becomes crucial that we see the flow. And when we do, we won't let somebody go to chapter 5, pull out verse 7 and say, this is what it means. Because you know the general meaning of it and you've seen how it develops. You say, Bob, I'm not good at outlining. None of us are at first. What you do is you try it. Then you go back to the study Bible, Bible encyclopedia, commentary. Look at their outline. Did you do it good? Did you come close? Oh, I see that now. That's the point. I, there's a division there. We learn by doing. We don't learn by thinking. We learn by doing. Okay, that's, that's the second question. I want to say again that the basic unit of thought in English is a paragraph. Not a word, not a sentence. Unfortunately, paragraphs do not have a textual marker. I can't say this is a paragraph. A paragraph is whatever is the same subject. I don't know if you ever have looked at my commentaries online, but what I do is I compare the Greek text, the New King James, the Revised Standard, today's English version. I would have used NIV, but they wanted $3,000 a book to let me use it. When they get saved, I may use it. And then Jerusalem Bible. And what I do is I show you their paragraphing. And I show you what, how, what, they call, what they call the subject of those paragraphs. So right there in comparison, if you were a teacher or a preacher, you would say, how many main points to my sermon should I have on this text? Well, then you've got to decide how many paragraphs you have. Because how many paragraphs is how many main points. And I don't want your three points in a poem, alliterated, I want Paul's outline. I want John's. How many points did they have? That's how many points you ought to have. I'm over it. 
Okay, those are the different readings. There is a fourth level, but I, I'm going to um, back off just a little bit on that. Uh, th if I was in a preaching class, if you were all preachers, I would put your nose to the grindstone. But fourth reading, just put it off until you get used to one through three, and you'll be a long way down the road. Okay, the next is a, in my notes is a sample of the genres of Scripture. Brothers and sisters, please, I hope you see me. If I, if I could cry or shout or beg you, I would do it. I was reading a little bit of this this afternoon. I just got overcome. <laughs> I read this and I say to myself, Bob, why are you writing this? These guys did such a good job. Bob, why did you write this seminar? I used to fret over this. I go to these, I go to these conferences where these guys have photographic memory. They remember every book they ever read, every piece of bacon they ever ate in every restaurant. And I forgot my wife's name till I kissed two of her fingers every morning. I mean, why am I doing this? And one of my students said to me, it was just a blessing. Like he said, Bob, you're not writing for them. You're writing for third world pastors who have no hope of seminary or education. That's exactly who I'm writing for. And that'll include you if you've had no background in this. So maybe it takes one to know one. Uh, I, I read books by scholars and I just want to go to bed and take two Tylenol PM. I'm, I want you to understand this book will bless your life. If you have a family member you love who's interested in Bible study, if you have a young person, this is a play on the word, the book, How to Read a Book for All It's Worth. This is how to read the Bible for all it's worth. It's $15. You can get it used for about two. Uh, Garden Fee is an assembly of God, the pastor who teaches at Regents College in British Columbia. Uh, Doug Stewart uh, is a New Testament, uh, Old Testament professor at Garden Conwell in Boston. I'm going to throw this to the front row, and I hope you'll pass it around. Okay? <laughs> if you steal it, the plagues of Leviticus will be on you. Okay, I'm going to go through that. <laughs> Just try to get folks' attention. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm just going to have to skip some of this. Um, I, I want to go, if you're following me in my outline, I'm on page 40, number D. Um, I know I just jumped up and down and screamed, and I'm going to do it again. If you could take one thing from me. Really, the two things that I think have helped me the most in revolutionizing my view of the Bible is that the Bible is written in different genres, and the Bible is an Eastern book, not a Western book. It's not all historical narrative. It's not all literal. And the reason that I don't understand it is that I am from a Western culture who analyzes truth in Greek logical method. Major premise, minor premise, logical conclusion. I'm looking for propositional truth, and the Bible does not co communicate truth like that. It communicates truth in stories, in parables. And listen, here's it, it's just coming. And intention filled pairs. We call them paradoxes, we call them dialectical tension. Now, that is what I really want to talk about. So, let me read this a bit, if you would. This insight has been the most helpful to me personally as one who loves and trusts the Bible as God's Word. In trying to take the Bible seriously, it became obvious that different texts reveal truth in selected, not systematic ways. I'm screaming now. One inspired text cannot cancel or depreciate another inspired text. I can't say I like Paul better than John. I like Deuteronomy better than Isaiah. I do not have the right as a believer to trample on an inspired text. I've got to take text seriously. But the Bible seems to present truth in different ways. Okay. Um, truth comes in knowing all Scripture, not just some or key ones. Truth comes in knowing all Scripture, not quoting a single passage. Most biblical truths, Eastern literature, are presented in dialectical or paradoxical pairs. Now, if I was in wisdom literature, now think with me for a minute, you know poetry, Hebrew poetry is not a rhyme, it's thought. 
You've heard of synonymous parallelism where the two lines say the same thing, right? That's synonymous parallelism. But you've you heard of antithetical parallelism. That's where the two lines of Proverbs or Psalms say exactly the opposite. What I'm saying to you is God used these different ways of presenting truth to communicate truth. The best analogy I have, I pastored in West Texas. It's the same field, goes all the way to Canada. It, it takes rain three years to run off. You got every road has two, two bar ditches and barbed wire fences. Now think with me, right? The Bible's going to present truth on the barbed wire fences. But we're not to get hung up in the barbed wire fence, nor are we to get in the left ditch or the right ditch. These two barbed wire fences are cause us to live in the tension and stay on the road. But what we've done is proof text the barbed wire fence and said the Bible settles it, that, that's it. It's all, it, that's the bumper sticker. The Bible says it, that settles it. What about the other barbed wire fence? That's also in the Bible. Now, I know this, I know this seems confusing. So the way I want to illustrate it is I want to take some doctrines and I want to ask you which one is true. Okay, which one is biblically true? Here's the series. Do you believe in predestination or do you believe in human free will? Can you see me lining up the text? I got, I got some here. I got some here. Wh which one are you going to choose? They're both in the Bible. So it's better to say it's not A or B. It's got to be A and B. So let me just take this first one. The best way to hold predestination, God is sovereign, and human free will together is the concept of covenant. Uh, an inspired God gave this covenant, but he demanded that human beings respond initially and continually. So there is a sovereign aspect and there is a, a human aspect, which is true. Yes. Here's another one. Do you believe in the security of the believer? Now, if you were in Texas, they'd go, amen. We often call it once saved, always saved. Do you believe in security or do you believe in perseverance? The missing doctrine in Baptist life is perseverance. Every letter to the seven churches says at the end, to him who overcomes, I will give the crown of life. Do not grow weary in well-doing. In due season you shall reap. If you faint not, <laughs> If, if, if this bothers you, it depends on your background. If you go to my website, click on special topics, click on apostasy. If you'll read that on apostasy and you'll read it on Christian assurance, you'll see I've laid out the biblical tension for you and with all the verses. And I hope if you're, if you're nervous, you'll, you'll do that. Do you believe in original sin or volitional sin? Am I lost because of Adam and Eve or am I lost because of my own choices? Yes. Is... Is Jesus God or is Jesus a man? Is Jesus equal to the Father or is Jesus subservient to the Father? Is the Bible the Word of God or is the Bible from human authorship? It's certainly from human vocabulary and, and syntax. Do you believe in sinlessness or do you believe in sinning less? Now, being a Baptist... We believe in sinning less. But if you know your Bible, Romans 6, it says Jesus has pulled the power supply of the sin nature. The only reason we continue to sin is because we're addicted to sin and we keep plugging the thing back in. Jesus has dealt with sin, but the, it goes on in, in our will. Um, do you believe in initial instantaneous justification and sanctification? Or do you believe in progressive sanctification? The moment I trust Christ, am I, am I holy? Am I a saint because I'm in Christ, not because of how I live? Is Jesus' righteousness imputed to my account when I'm saved? Am I in him, therefore I am holy? Yes. Well, then why at the end of chapter 5, Matthew 5, 48, to say, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy? Because though I am positionally holy, I'm called on to possess my position. So which is biblically true? Yes. Uh, do you believe in justification by faith 
Or do you believe in justification confirmed by works? Woo, Baptists are, they're choking now, man. They are choking. That's why I left Texas. I, I just left them choking. See, we've been told anything talking about works is works righteousness. But I want to remind you of Ephesians 2.10. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works. That it was foreordained you should walk in them. I want to remind you of James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Faith without works is dead. Now, works do not bring us to God, but works confirm that we have met Him. You can't know Him and your life be the same. Impossible. I hope you see what I'm doing. I'm taking every major doctrine and saying to you, the Bible presents it in two what seemingly opposite ways. This is characteristically Eastern, and you're Western. That's why you got a rash right now. Do you believe in Christian freedom, or am I my brother's keeper? I was talking to Stephen earlier. Man, I am one free Christian. I don't have any rules on me. I, I do not. But because I work with God's people, I have limited my freedom so that I don't offend anybody. <laughs> Now, I gave that back to G I gave my freedom that he gave me back to him as a sign that I love him and want to work with those who have not come to freedom yet. This is uh, Romans 14, 1 through 15, 13. Paul says, Will you <laughs> do not dispute doubtful points except your weak old brother. That's 14, 1. Then he says to the strong, Will you? For your so-called freedom, destroy the brother for whom Christ died? <laughs> Boy, you get slapped any way you go. Do you believe that God is transcendent, the Holy One, to see Him is to die? Or do you believe He's Abba Father? Come sit on my lap. Do you believe it, that God is ultimately unknowable, Job? Or do you believe He is knowable in Scripture and in Christ? Now, friends, if you think you know God, you are an arrogant so-and-so. None of us know God, but we know enough about God to give ourselves to Him. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? We wouldn't need you if you knew, wouldn't need God if you knew about it. Do you believe in the, um, Paul's many metaphors for salvation? Now, I'm going to give you six of them. I was in an uh, uh, evangelical theological society meeting not too long ago, and there was a paper presented, Is C.S. Lewis a Christian? Ah! I thought it was so stupid I had to go. <laughs> Somebody wrote a paper entitled that. C.S. Lewis did not like, and I, don't, I forgot which one of these he didn't like, but one of these seven metaphors of Paul he didn't like. And so this person said, because he didn't like one of Paul's metaphors on salvation, he's not a Christian. You want to kick him in the face in Jesus' name, don't you? I mean, really. Here they are. Adoption. Law court. Sanctification. From the temple. Redemption, the slave block. Glorification, temple. Predestination, reconciliation. Now, all of those are true. It's a diamond with different facets. How stupid is it to say, I don't like facet number four. So if you don't agree with me, you're just not a believer. Don't you see what we do to each other? We pull our favorite proof text, judge everybody in light of what we think, and claim that we have the mind of God. It, it's just not true. Now, I see the time. i got just a little more time, and I want to talk about a certain kind of book. I know you pastors have this, so if, if you want to rent your books out for $5 a day after this, that'd be good. People always say to me, Bob, you've been studying the Bible for 50 years. That's why you know these different categories. How do I find these different categories? There's one set of books. They are very biased. They're the most biased theological book you can buy. But they're the only book I know that can do this. We call them systematic theologies. They're written by Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists and Pentecostals. And what they do, they take subjects and divide the, all Scripture into subjects. God, man, sin, salvation, heaven, Jesus. They divide it into subjects. Then they go to everywhere in the Bible this subject is talked about. And they show you the verses. And they... First of all, I am an exegete. I believe we've got to go through books of the Bible. So systematic theologians, in my opinion, often takes things out of context. But what these books will do very quickly is show you how the concept of God is given in different ways. 
And that's what you want to see. So you won't get hung up on one text. Now again, you don't just read these. These will hurt you at night. You don't pick one of these and read unless you're in prison. <laughs> Got a lot of time. You go to the index. You're preaching on John 12, 1 through 10. Okay, go to the index. Look, there's 20 pages on John 12, 1 through 10. Write those page numbers down. Okay, put that away. Go to this book. Turn to the first page number. Look down the page till you find John 12 something. Okay, it's in a paragraph here. Here's the topic it's about. I'm going to read that. If suddenly I find something I didn't know or found something real good, I'm going to read the rest of that page. Then I'm going to go to the next page number. Find the text. Read the paragraph if it's helpful. And suddenly I'm going to start seeing how this all fits together. Another way to do it, if it's a topic, is to go to a Bible encyclopedia. Look up predestination. They're going to lay it out. Look up propitiation. They're going to lay it out. Look up sanctification. They're going to lay it out. And they're going to give you all the places this is talked about. And this is the way you begin to find these different uh, aspects of Scripture. I would like to recommend two to you, if I could. The one that has been a, a real blessing to me is Millard Erickson's. It's called Christian Theology, Second Edition. Um, it's really a good book because if you ever have a hurricane up here, it's so big you can keep your door closed with it. <laughs> they used to call it the green monster in seminary. Uh, it is huge, but it's so big it's got all these wonderful references on all these subjects. You can get it so cheap online. I go to Amazon.com, put the author in, find the book, go to used, and usually it's $3 to mail it and $5 to buy it. Something like that. The other one that's been a blessing to me is Frank Stagg, uh, New Testament Theology. Another one is George Ladd, L-A-D-D, -D, from Fuller Seminary, uh, New Testament Theology. Um, there are many uh, by Presbyterians. When I was young, I remember sitting under a tree in Houston, just surrendered to preach, and I bought this systematic theology by Burkhoff, big blue thing, and I was reading it. I was overwhelmed. I was, it was like waves were hitting me that I had never seen before, never heard of. And I remember saying to God, if you'll help me understand this, I'll share it as long as you give me breath. And that's what I'm doing in Sheboygan Falls.